Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday, Monday Mindset, Mindset Podcast, Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 95. And this week, round two of recording this episode. If you listen to last week's episode, you will know we had some serious technical issues. Technical issues with yours to start with, we thought, which were rescued. And then it turned out that it was me who was at fault and nothing but static That's right. <laughs> when I came to edit. So I had to do a very quick swap. So we are back with Terry, who has already shared with me. But so, Terry, <laughs> what have you got to share with the rest of our listeners today? Well, hopefully, Daisy, I can do this justice <laughs> because it's been a few weeks since I've looked at it. But it's a podcast. It should be perfect. Yeah, it's Practice great. makes perfect. That's right. <laughs> but it's a podcast episode that I've listened to a number of times because I really enjoy it for so many reasons. It's got so many kind of gems in it. It is an episode from one of my favorites that I hadn't done in quite a while, and that is Lewis Howe's The School of Greatness. And it's episode 1181. Just think, Daisy, someday you and I are going to be at episode 1181. Um, and it's called The Secret to Avoiding Burnout and Reshaping Your Identity with Benjamin Hardy. And I'm starting to find that oftentimes what I read in the title isn't what I hear in the episode, because to me, this has so many other things in it besides what the title would lead you to believe. But Benjamin Hardy is an organizational psychologist, and he does some writing with a psychologist named Daniel Sullivan. And there's a book out, and I've not read the book yet, but um, really love this concept. And I actually heard about this while I was recording another episode with someone else. And we were talking about, you know, measuring progress and things. And he said, have you read the book, The Gap and the Gain? And I said, no, but now I will. Mm -hmm. So talked about measuring ourselves and our success, whether we are looking at that from the perspective of the gap or the gain. And so the gap is comparing yourself with what you think you should have or should be achieving, comparing yourself to others or imposed expectations. So if you think, okay, I'm 52, I should be at this place now, Everything you're measuring is not enough because it's in the gap. And then when you are measuring or assessing or looking at the gain, that is focusing on how you have changed or improved. So it's comparing yourself only against yourself, not from an external expectation, not to other people, or not to where you should be at this point. But that idea of how are you doing with this goal? Are you doing the things you want to be doing? Are you changing and evolving? So he brings in a concept by another psychologist, author, Daniel Gilbert, who writes about the psychology of your future self. And I listen to a lot of people who really highlight this. And, and I think it's an important concept for some of us to be thinking about and that is that you are not your former self. You've had new experiences, new insights, new goals, new values. But oftentimes we get stuck thinking of ourselves in the past, where we were, and trying to kind of look at things from that past perspective. So if we look at our former self versus our current self, the gain, again, is that you compare your current self with your past self. How have I developed? How have I grown? What new ideas? What new skills? Now, your future self requires a growth mindset. So that's the third self. There's the former, the current, and the future self. And that requires having that growth mindset that's open to the possibility that who I am today is different than who I'll be in a few days, a few months, a few years. I'm going to continue to expand and learn and grow. And he talked about the idea that our current self really is temporary and it's developing. It's in the developmental process. Opposite to the growth mindset is if we have a fixed mindset. 
And that's very rooted in looking at only our current self or our past self. This is who I am. And this is how my future will go because this is who I am. Or this is who I am because this is what I've always done. So it's really being stuck in defining ourselves based on just our current self and our past self versus that growth mindset of how am I evolving? How am I growing and changing? So I think it's important then to think about, well, why do these different selves really matter? And he talked about the idea that our current self is not really well equipped to plan for the future long term. Can do a little better with short term, but because we're going to change quite a bit as we continue to evolve, we can't make long term decisions for our future self right now. He also talked about that the area of our brain that allows you to have empathy for others also allows you to have empathy for your future self. And this is really important because if you have empathy for your future self, you're going to want to help your future self. You're going to want to help your future self to reach that future being and to reach goals and to feel good. And On the opposite of that, the fixed mindset prevents you from seeing your future self with empathy. It doesn't allow you to see that you're going to grow and change and even have different needs. It just keeps you, again, stuck in the current self and past self. So why is this important to any of us? So basically, he uses the phrase kind of developing a friendship with your future self. And research shows that When you have a lack of empathy or connection to your future self, you're going to make worse short-term decisions because you're going to be making these decisions based on seeking of present dopamine, and those are more destructive. And I think for everyone, using a weight loss example is easy here, and it happens to be the field that I work in and kind of how you and I got to know each other, but If I don't have this positive connection with my future self and a hot fudge sundae is available, I am much more likely to make that decision to eat that hot fudge sundae right now because I want that dopamine response right now. And I don't care very much about how it affects my future self. But if I'm more connected with future self, have more empathy for it, I'm more willing then to endure some cost or maybe even some discomfort in the present moment Mm. in order to support that future self. So I think in my work, this is a huge concept to be thinking about. If I can be more connected and have more empathy for my future self, that can help me to make decisions now that will be less destructive to me in the long term. I won't be seeking that immediate dopamine. He talks a lot about using these terms, whether something is a cost or an investment. When we're less connected to our future self, we're more likely going to suffer costs in the future rather than making investments now. He talked about the fact that you love what you invest in and you get what you value. And I think this is really important to think about when we, as our identity, kind of say, I really believe in this or I value this. But if our behavior is incongruent with it, it's not what we're getting. And so you get what you value. And your identity really is shaped by what you are most committed to, your values, your beliefs, and how you define yourself. A concept of identity was pretty heavy in this episode, and you and I have talked before about James Clear and talking about building habits and connected to your identity, and that habits are easier to build and develop when they're congruent with your identity. So again, Benjamin Hardy talks about your identity is what you invest 100% in, and what you're 100% committed to reflects what you get in your results. So the view of your future influences this identity. Again, it's what you're committed to, and then your identity drives your behavior. So if I'm not very connected to my future identity as something positive, the behavior that's going to be driven right now is going to be more problematic for me. So he encourages people to really focus on who you want to be 
And I don't mean to say this, like I think we're all in the process of becoming someone else. But if you think about your future self, how do you want that to look? Do you want to be healthy? Do you want to be balanced? Do you want to be connected socially? Do you want to be financially sound? So focus on who you want to be and that this does not have to be based on your past beliefs and values, but start where you are and who do you want to be in the future looking at that identity. I think it is important to look at how we got here. And Benjamin Hardy talked a little bit about looking at, reflecting on what got you here that won't get you where you're going. Mm. Because sometimes how we got here was out of, again, a different place in our lives, different needs, different values, different things that we needed to focus on. But are those still the things that are going to get us where we want to be in our future? So there may be a, a shift that we need to do. So I talked about then, as you think about this, you know, moving toward what your future self and things, he talked about motivation. And he talked a little bit about the fact that approach or avoid motivation are very different. And focusing on what you want, so approach motivation, approaching something, helps you build more motivation than by focusing on what you don't want. And for me, this brings in the whole concept of law of attraction, that if I just keep saying, I don't want Mm. more debt, I don't want more debt, I don't want more debt, all I'm focusing on is debt. Versus if I focus more on what I want, I want financial freedom, I want, you know, to feel comfortable in my relationship with money, that's a very different thing to work toward than the avoidance of something. So I think that's an important concept, that approach as better than avoid. Yes, that reminds me of, I would like to say the last episode, but it's not, it's the next episode, but it's the last episode, as in we've already recorded it. That was the second part of my episode, getting very confusing, but it was talking about the difference between process and outcomes and it was basically the idea that you can't control the outcome but the thing that made me think of it that ties in with what you were saying is this negative framework and she was talking about from a sports point of view of playing a match or whatever it is Mm -hmm. heading out onto that field focusing on playing not to lose Mm -hmm. and her whole point is that as soon as you step out onto the field, you let go of expectations and you trust in the process, you trust in the work you've put in and you actually experience what you're going out there to do. But yes, it's this it's this framework of, yes, playing not to lose, like you were saying about this, you know, the law of attraction. What's that attracting? What is that? It's just putting it in. It's that little ticking over in your brain. I'm trying so hard not to lose. I'm trying so hard not to lose. Make you second guess yourself. Goes Mm -hmm. way back to that um, episode. It's probably in the first 10 we recorded. It was one of yours. And I can't for the life of me remember her name. But it was that one she was saying, um, how you put a golfer off his swing. Mm -hmm. You ask them how they perform that swing. You know, what are they doing with their elbow? Whatever it was, you just you take their focus off. And you once you start doing that, you second guess yourself and you Mm -hmm. Instead of losing yourself in the experience and trusting on the work you've put in, it all goes off kilter. And I think in that example with playing to not lose, you most likely are going to make decisions that are guarded, Mm. that are reactive versus are just all in investment. You're more focused on the cost. Uh Uh-oh, what cost did that do for me or for us as a team? And so I think these concepts, and this is one of the things that you and I keep talking about, even off recording, is how much everything overlaps. Mm. One person talks about it in this way, someone else talks about it in this way, but there's such connected concepts. So again, he talked about 
investing in your future self and the idea that whatever you invest money in, you become more committed to. And I'm sure so many of us have found that. I swear this might be one of those things where I like to defy the odds. <laughs> I like to invest money in things and then avoid it. Um, but in general, you know, where you invest, you become more committed. So not just money, but the more you become invested in, I want to be healthy, the more committed you are to behaviors that are healthy for you. The more committed you get to this relationship, the more your behaviors to support this relationship are going to follow. Yes, I think it has to go past money, doesn't it? I mean, we're both guilty of investing in sports equipment or if funnily enough, I was just having this conversation with my good friend Kelly the other day and I was saying, at least with the exercise programs that I buy these days, there's no video or DVD that, mm. <laughs> that stacks up that I end up having to throw away. Yes, we, we were laughing because I was telling her about, she just reminded me, something she said reminded me of the fact that I'd bought some um, dance exercise program that looked good on a Facebook ad. <laughs> and she laughed, she was oh, you know what? I think I've got that. I think I bought that as well. <laughs> the problem with them now not having the videos or the books or whatever is that I forget that I bought them. And, mm. you know, the emails are somewhere in the ether, but I'm still paying yeah. for them. So, yes, it's no guarantee that if you spent money on it that you will invest in it. <laughs> That's right. But the idea of investment, like I said, no, it's about your identity. The more I invest in this as important to me, the more committed I am to following through with the steps or you know whatever I need to do. So they talked some then about kind of what's challenging about being in the gap or looking at your life in the gap. And probably many of us have experienced this and we have to kind of catch ourselves. But Unfortunately, when you're when you're assessing from in the gap, it really doesn't matter what you've accomplished because you're only looking at what you haven't done yet. So let's say, for example, I want to lose 50 pounds and I've lost five. If I'm really looking at it from the gap, I have 45 pounds to lose and I shouldn't need to lose this much weight at this point in my life. Hmm, yeah. Now we've just minimized the fact that we've lost five pounds. So being in the perspective of the gap, you can see pretty quickly how it can really limit us in our motivation, in our feeling positive about ourselves, and feeling positive about our future self because, we, again, we get stuck in the past. Yeah, and where you should be. And that's, well, that's always the problem, especially when it comes to losing weight mm -hmm. is the comparison mm -hmm. to others. Well, they did the same approach that I'm doing mm -hmm. and they lost X amount in the first two weeks. Yeah. So I should be doing that. So again, a great example of looking at it from in the gap, mm. I'm not doing as well as other people versus, wow, I did this over these past two weeks. And maybe it's not just looking at the number of pounds. Maybe it's looking at, exactly. I stopped yeah. snacking over these last two weeks. Great. That's a great thing to measure. But when we're Looking from the perspective of the gap, we don't see those things. We don't celebrate those small steps, as BJ Fogg would call them, those tiny habits. We don't celebrate those little things. Now, that's what always breaks my heart when I see a post reaming mm. off all the things that are so much better. I feel better. Everything fits better. This is better. This is better. But I only lost one pound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything is judged on that. Yeah. But... And everybody else is doing this. So mm -hmm. how come it's all gone wrong? Hold on a minute. Let's just take off that last bit. Yeah. <laughs> Let's look at the majority of what you just said. How is that not a good thing? That's amazing. So again, like you just said, all of those positive things that that person mm -hmm. experienced are totally negated when they're looking at the gap of how many pounds should I have lost by this point? It's a great example. And he described it that it's a term that social scientists call being on the hedonic treadmill. I think things are going to get good when I reach this point. I never reach that point because I just keep moving that point. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always in the seeking of getting there instead of being able to appreciate where I am. 
Yeah, well, that's that harps back to your episode about happiness and success, doesn't mm -hmm. it? And I think this was in that episode as well, but kind of the idea that if you're using the gap to measure yourself, to assess how you're doing, you're always chasing a moving target because our idea of success continues to change. If I get here, I think I should be there. So I can't really celebrate yet. I'm in pursuit still. And then when I get there, I'm just going to look out here and I'm just going to keep moving that target further and further out. So again, that's an interesting perspective, how you could just flip what you just said about it's always a moving target when you're looking forward like that. But you could just turn it slightly and look at that same trajectory, but looking those steps back in comparison you know, look how far I've come. Look at these mm -hmm. steps I've been taking. It's difficult sort of trying to get your head around it. I've been, as you've been talking, I've been making notes about past and future. And, mm -hmm. and like often with these things, you sort of seem to see some contradictions and how does that work? And, and mm -hmm. that seems to make sense. And then I talk about it, about looking back, but you said before about not comparing with the past. It's, it's funny, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. not always easy to grasp these things but yes just that slightly different perspective that future goal is always moving forwards when you're mm -hmm. measuring it that way and it's a moving target but you only look at it slightly differently that moving target that you're always moving towards you're failing to see all those steps forward you're taking I think for me the one of the takeaways about this is and I remember when you and I first recorded this, <laughs> I said, one of the dangers is we can just go back and almost lament or even say, yeah, but remember when I, and I keep using this just because it's such an easy example, but remember before I gained this 20 pounds? So I can't see this gained 20 pounds as being progress from when I didn't have these 20 pounds. Mm. So you have to look at the other things. What else has changed? Well, you know, that was before I broke my leg and had to be immobile for four months and then COVID began and okay. So how are you actually doing? What have you been improving? What are you taking on now versus comparing yourself to a past point when you feel like you were doing better? That's not the past comparison that he's supporting. Mm. It's more looking at the progress you're making. So looking at the habit changes, you know, looking at the, again, using the terms from both James Clear and BJ Fogg talk about celebrating the little successes, the tiny steps. So if I started working on becoming a half marathon runner two months ago, well, since that time, I've gotten up to the point where I can run three miles now. Or I've gotten to the point where I don't dread going out every time I'm going for a run mm. versus, wow, I still have 10 more miles mm -hmm. to figure out how to do. That's the gap. The gain is I'm making progress on this. I'm developing skills. I'm getting better at this. I think if you've listened to their episode as many times as I've had, <laughs> you start hearing it a lot in your conversations, in your you know self-talk that when you're in the gap, you're always unsatisfied because you're measuring yourself against something you have not attained versus when you measure from the gain, you're seeing progress and progress, success begets motivation. It builds motivation. Feeling like you're lagging behind and failing almost never creates motivation. No. So to start working in the gain, to start kind of moving in that way of seeing yourself, he talked about the idea that most of us have to stop measuring ourselves against ideals. You know, stop looking at the BMI chart. Mm -hmm. um, stop seeing, well, what's the projected income for people in my field at this stage in my career? Because that really isn't relevant to you specifically. Your career path has been different or your current environment is different. And instead to start deciding your own reference points, using your own internal measurements 
and what is important to you, your values. I'm making progress in my company. I've gotten four promotions in the past two years. Do you like what you're doing? No, I hate what I'm doing. And I, I got here by, you know, stepping on other people. Well, those things aren't very motivating and don't feel really good versus, you know what? I haven't gotten any promotions, but I'm doing so much better in my job. I'm now leading other people on my team. So again, looking at the gains, what's important to you? Mm. If the promotion is the thing that's most important, then yeah, that's how you're going to want to assess. But if your impact on other people is more important to you, be looking at that rather than this external measurement or reference point. And interestingly, talked a little bit about, we've been taught to focus on these external reference points. We learn it in school. We have grades, we have percentage, we have averages, we have standardized test scores, Mm. We have the first place team, the second place team. We've really been taught to measure ourselves against external reference points. And so to start changing this for ourselves, we have to figure out what are our own reference points? What things do we value? And also to think about whose value of your progress matters. So focusing on your own valuing of your progress rather than giving credence to what other people value or what other people place as value on your progress. So if someone else says, that's great, you've gotten four promotions in the past two years, you are very successful. But if I feel like I've sold my soul to do that, Mm -hmm. again, I'm, I'm letting their value of my success outweigh what's actually important to me. And so learning to focus on our own valuing of our progress, not what anyone else says about it. And I know that that's not an easy step for most of us. You can feel that mismatch, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're thinking inside that you don't value that and then somebody else is telling you that that outcome is valuable. Mm -hmm. If you're constantly having that mismatch, it doesn't make Mm -hmm. you feel good, does it? No. And it really does not foster motivation. It doesn't foster us to No, it completely undermines it, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It kind of stagnates most of us. And then I put a note in my notes that this is where you and I stopped the first time. I remember saying this at that time because I bold printed it in my notes here. But this is, though, it's really important that we don't dig deep in our past to make these comparisons. Like, yeah, but in my first two years of my career, I was doing this and now I'm not. Okay, but that was 30 years ago, different situation, different values, different job. And so- 30 years younger. (laughs) That's right. So really right now, starting kind of measuring your progress in the now rather than comparing it to the deep past. So- For example, in the past couple of weeks, I've gotten back into fasting more. It will not help me to say, yeah, but I remember four years ago, I did fasting so consistently. I was so good at it. Well, now I just feel bad. Mm. But if I say, look, over the past three weeks, I've increased my fasting quite a bit from where I was, and I'm noticing some changes. That's being in the gain building motivation and feeling good, celebrating the steps along the way. You can feel the difference, can't you? You can feel the openness, expansion Mm -hmm. is a word that we've used before, but the possibilities, the opportunities, it feels Mm -hmm. open to all those things Mm -hmm. rather than just that closed comparison. Well, it's not good enough because it's not as good as then when it was perfect. When you have, and of course, you always remember it as being far more perfect than it actually mm-hmm. was. And I think this goes back to the whole piece around past self, current self, and future self. To really feel good and be positive about the direction we're going, better to have a focus on our future self. And staying stuck in the gap, staying stuck on past self or current self with that fixed belief won't help us to move forward into that future self. So that thing that you can feel when I use those examples, 
you can feel it just, it makes you feel stuck. Mm. You stay stuck in current and past self versus moving into future self. I particularly liked what you were saying about the importance of empathy and using that, the, the same part of your brain that uses empathy for others, using that for your future self. And it made me think of the word nurturing mm. and how a parent would be with a child it felt like a good image to me. You know, you're thinking of their future self and you're thinking of all the potential possibilities that are out there and all you're focused on for that child is to nurture them and open and expand their world to those possibilities. It's all about that as you tied in the growth mindset and the opportunities. And I just really like that way of looking at it and those words, you know, empathy, nurturing, growth mindset. It made me think of, I was like, I see you talking in all sorts of different directions at the moment with the video editing I'm doing. So I get a bit confused with all the different places I've heard your words of wisdom. Mm. But you were talking about, it was the week when you were talking about managing your lower brain. And I forget, mm. I think it might have been Julie Simon, the author, where you were talking about how you managed that lower brain, the part of your brain that is the sort of fight or flight type decisions, but with a much more nurturing, I'm trying to remember, mm -hmm. it was the sort of nurturing adult with the unruly child. It mm -hmm. was a much more of a gentle nurturing mm -hmm. relationship. It made me think of that as well. But I just, I just liked that image of thinking of your future self as something that you nurture because of all this possibility there is out there. Rather than it being something you're just going to like bang out of yourself yeah. right now to become. It's <laughs> yeah. like, wow, that's kind of rough. Absolutely. So I think we'll stop here for today and then we'll pick up because there's even more to this episode that just kind of keeps building and some other concepts of like burnout and willpower that I think are really valuable from this episode. So I hope everyone has a great week and I look forward to sharing more. Sounds exciting. Have a great week. Bye.